This is Matthew Cratters, Bitcoin University. Today, I want to talk about Bitcoin nodes, Bitcoin mining pools, and spam. And we're really going to be getting down to the basics and the, te the technicals of how this works. So here we have the Bitcoin blockchain. It's a series of interlocking blocks in a particular chronological order, stretching all the way back to the Genesis block of January 3rd, 2009. And blocks are mined every 10 minutes on average. It's actually every 9 minutes and 50 50 seconds on average, but that's another discussion for another video. But they're basically mined every 10 minutes on average. And then every node on the network builds its own version of the Bitcoin blockchain by adding newly mined blocks to that node's existing blockchain, at least blocks that don't violate any of Bitcoin's rules. Every node on the network also has a place, namely its own mempool, where it keeps new transactions that have not yet been included in a block. And then nodes on the network send unconfirmed transactions, transactions that have not yet been included in a block. They send these transactions from their mempools to each other, and they also relay newly mined blocks back and forth to each other so that everyone can discover the latest newly mined block. Each newly mined block contains transactions that have been chosen by the mining pool or a solo miner who mined the block. And when a mining pool is getting ready to try to compete to mine the next block, it decides which Bitcoin transactions it's going to include in the next block, usually choosing the transactions that are paying the highest transaction fees, but not always. Now, where does a mining pool get these Bitcoin transactions to try to include in its next block? Usually they're sent to the mining pool's node by other nodes on the Bitcoin network. And a mining pool can also accept transactions directly. This is what's called out-of-bound transactions or out-of-bound payments. A mining pool can put its own transactions into a block, namely mine its own transactions, or it can put transactions into a block that have been directly submitted to the mining pool, thus bypassing all the other nodes on the network. Direct submissions to a mining pool almost always cost more money. In other words, have a higher transaction fee since the mining pool is taking a risk that its new block will not be accepted by nodes on the network. In other words, it might get orphaned because it takes longer to verify a block that contains transactions that a node has never seen before. So if two mining pools mine two different new blocks at the exact same time, nodes will accept the first honest block that they see and add to their own version of the Bitcoin blockchain. And before they can do that, they obviously have to look through the block and make sure it's not violating any rules. And then that choice of the block they just added to their own blockchain, it will be confirmed and strengthened if a mining pool mines the next block on top of that block. So you have these blocks being stacked on each other. And it's always the longest chain or the chain with the most proof of work that wins. So if a mining pool is adding direct submission out of bound transactions to a block and these out of bound, these direct submission transactions are transactions that most nodes on the network have never seen before because they've been directly submitted to the mining pool, then that block may end up getting verified by nodes after a simultaneously mined block that contains transactions that most nodes have already seen before since they were sent from node to node across the network. Because nodes will need to reach out to the mining pool to get information about that directly submitted transaction that the nodes have never seen before. And then they need to hear back from the mining pool before they can completely verify the new block. So a block that contains all transactions that have been, re been relayed across the network is likely to be confirmed first and verified first and added to each Bitcoin nodes version of the blockchain. And so if a mining pool goes to all of that work, all of that trouble to mine a block, and it currently costs about, call it $340,000 on average to mine a block, if a mining pool goes to all that work to mine a block and then nodes pick a different simultaneously mined block, the mining pool that accepted the direct submission transaction gets zero reward. It doesn't get the 3.125 Bitcoin plus transaction fees after spending tons of money on depreciating equipment and electricity. And that's why on average transaction fees for direct submissions to mining pools need to be higher than transaction fees for transactions that are freely relayed by nodes around the network. So remember this fact, it will be very important later in this video. Direct submissions to a mining pool cost more on average than sending Bitcoin transactions the normal way at the same time from node to node across the network. Now this whole thing is a messy and chaotic process, but the really cool thing is that all nodes on the Bitcoin network eventually converge to the same exact version of the Bitcoin blockchain, certainly after about five or six blocks. Very important, once a block has five new blocks stacked on top of it, and I'm simplifying a little bit here. You can read the Bitcoin white paper if you want to understand more. But basically, once a block has five new blocks stacked on top of it, that block is stuck in the Bitcoin blockchain forever. 
and all the transactions inside of that block are in the Bitcoin blockchain forever and there's nothing you can do about it. If you're finding this video interesting so far, I just ask you to help to support this channel's educational mission. Hit the subscribe button. That does really help a lot. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video and share this video with a friend or family member. Now, if some spam has been put into that newly mined block, that means that some poor family, let's say in Bolivia in the year 2080, who wants to run a Bitcoin node, in order to use Bitcoin as money, that poor family is going to have to download that block and waste time examining some cartoon picture of a frog that some rich American crypto VC put in there in the year 2025. That frog cartoon is stuck in there forever. And that in itself should make you furious. Now, why can't we remove the spam transaction from the block and quote unquote purify the block? That's because every new Bitcoin block that is mined includes a hash of the previous block and that previous block contains a hash of the block before it, stretching all the way back to the Genesis block of January 3rd, 2009. So if you change even the tiniest thing about a block, including removing a spam transaction, it messes up every single subsequent block. And then you also run into double spending problems, all the the spent, spent Bitcoin and unspent Bitcoin, the accounting doesn't work for it. So this is great news for monetary transactions, the fact that you cannot tamper with blocks and it's great because we want these monetary transactions to be preserved forever in the blockchain, not tampered with. And we want to be able to verify the whole chain of ownership going all the way back to the Genesis block. So this is great news for monetary transactions, but it means that it's impossible to remove spam once it has been included in a block that is five blocks deep in the blockchain. It doesn't matter if you're running Bitcoin Knots or Bitcoin Core, they both use the same historical version of the blockchain. And you can't change the blockchain, which is ultimately a good thing. So now we need to switch and talk about the SegWit soft fork of 2017. This was the culmination of the so-called block size wars. SegWit just stands for segregated witness. Witness data is basically transaction signature data. And what you did, what you do under SegWit after this soft fork was included in everything, your node will basically segregate or separate the witness data, hence segregate witness. Your node will separate the witness data from the, from the regular transaction data. And then this witness data will get a transaction fee discount of about 75%. The original intention of this witness discount was to make it cheaper to consolidate, in other words, to combine UTXOs, which are just chunks of unspent Bitcoin. The original intention of this witness discount was to make it cheaper to consolidate UTXOs, thus incentivizing people to consolidate UTXOs, which is a good thing for the overall network since each of these chunks of Bitcoin, each of these UTXOs that hasn't been spent yet, need to be kept track of by nodes in case someone decides to spend them sometime in the future in a Bitcoin transaction. Now, unfortunately, this witness discount was exploited by dog porn spammer Casey Rodimore. Don't ask me about the dog porn piece. You can Google that. But this witness discount was exploited by this individual who created the inscriptions hack with the result that the UTXO set has exploded instead of shrinking. So even though SegWit made the Lightning Network possible, which is a great thing, and the Lightning Network is working really well and doing great things for Bitcoin, but even though SegWit made the Lightning Network possible, it also gave Bitcoin spammers a huge transaction fee discount if they embed their spam in the witness data. This inscriptions hack was also made possible by the 2021 Taproot soft fork. When you spend from a Taproot address, in other words, a pay to TR or P P2TR pay to Taproot, when you spend from one of these new address types, there's a bug in the Bitcoin software where the witness data behaves slightly differently and allows people to embed more arbitrary data in the witness than was previously allowed under previous policy limits. And it's really this bug that makes large inscriptions possible. And this bug, this, leap, this loophole has never been fixed by Bitcoin Core over the years. Huh, I wonder why. It's so weird that Bitcoin Core's actions always err on the side of allowing more spam, and then they refuse to fix these spam bugs once they occur. And this is really important to remember the next time a Bitcoin Core dev comes to you with a really bright idea for the next soft fork for Bitcoin, maybe CTV or something like that. You should ask him or her what new unintended consequence or exploit this new soft fork may enable, just like this combination of Taproot and SegWit enabled the inscriptions spam. It's always the unknown unknowns that get you. 
All of which is to say that even Bitcoin Core devs are really, really bad when it comes to thinking through the second and third order effects of changing Bitcoin's code. So now our poor Bolivian family of 2080 needs to download and store a monstrosity forever, an inscription's monstrosity, thanks to spammers like Udi Wertheimer and malicious mining pools like Luxor. And there's no better example of ugly fiat art than this. This is the inscription, the famous inscription that was included in a block using this hack, this combination of SegWit and Taproot. This is what the block looks like. It's an almost completely full block. It's almost four megabytes. And the entire block, basically the entire block or most of the block is this awful piece of art, this, this really crappy wizard picture. So what will be the unintended consequences of the latest changes to Bitcoin made by Bitcoin Core, which just decided to blow open the Operturn filter in its next software release coming out in October? Filters, spam filters do work quite well, which is why Bitcoin Core needed to remove this filter, obviously. Since if Core hadn't done this, Bitcoin nodes running Bitcoin Core would have refused to relay transactions containing more than 83 bytes of Operturn data. And if nodes refuse to relay these large Operturn transactions, then spammers need to submit their transactions directly to a mining pool, like we were talking about earlier in this video, which, as we demonstrated earlier, always costs more money in transaction fees to go direct. Filters work in the sense that they make it more difficult to send non-standard transactions across the network, the peer-to-peer -peer network from node to node, thus forcing spammers to pay the higher fees associated with direct submissions of transactions to mining pools. So filters are not perfect and they don't stop every single non-standard transaction from being relayed, but they do create a lot of frictions. Frictions, uncertainty, and higher transaction fees for spammers who are then forced to go directly to mining pools because nodes won't relay their spam transactions. Does this help to increase mining pool centralization? That's one of the critiques, since spammers will prefer to go directly to the largest mining pools for their direct submissions in order to have a better chance of getting their spam into the next block. Yes, it probably does increase mining pool centralization at the margins, but the thing is mining pool centralization is already really, really bad. We've talked about this before, where there are just a few people in the world doing block template construction. In other words, deciding which transactions get included in the next block. So mining pool centralization is already really, really bad. And Core has done nothing about it over the years. Stratum V2 has been completely dead in the water for years. And it's really only ocean mining that has a viable solution to mining pool centralization that is actually being used today, namely ocean and datum. Which is funny because it's the ocean guys who are also leading the charge against this outbreak of spam that Bitcoin Core has refused to filter. I'm not being paid or compensated in any way by ocean mining, uh, though I do like the guys who work there and think they're doing really good work. In summary, Bitcoin Core has everything exactly backwards. Core wants nodes to be forced to relay whatever kind of transactions have been making their way into recent blocks. Given the choice of what Bitcoin should be, sort of existentially given the choice of what Bitcoin should be to mining pools that only care about maximizing short-term profits and are thus very happy to include spam even if it triggers some sort of tragedy of the commons by filling the blockchain with garbage that poor Bolivian families are going to still have to be downloading in the year 2080 and maybe even in a thousand years from now. In other words, Bitcoin Core puts the wishes of Bitcoin mining pools ahead of the wishes of Bitcoin node runners who just want to use Bitcoin as money and have zero interest in relaying spam transactions or being forced to store them once they have made their way into a block. It's almost like Bitcoin Core has been compromised to the point where the priorities of crypto VCs and their spam startups and malicious mining pools are being put above the priorities of Bitcoin node runners. Bitcoin node runners who ironically are the actual customers of Bitcoin Core. Now, pro-spam devs will try to distract you with the fact that Operturn outputs, outputs are prunable, meaning that they can be safely discarded by nodes because these outputs are not spendable in the future. But this ignores the fact that these outputs still need to be downloaded initially and verified by nodes as unspendable, which wastes bandwidth to download and it also wastes computing time and power to verify. For something that's not even meant to be on, Bit on the Bitcoin blockchain, namely non-monetary data, and in practice, your node cannot actually prune this data, get rid of this data, and still provide a good user experience. This post from Bitcoin Mechanic 
He writes, using a wallet connected to your own node is the way, and we've talked about this. You download Bitcoin Knots, run a node, and connect your Sparrow wallet to it. But let's be honest, most wallet software that allows this requires an Electrum server or electors, and this is how we use uh, Bitcoin Knots with Sparrow in most cases, especially if you're using, for example, Start9 server or some external personal server. So most wallet software that allows this requires an Electrum server, and Electrum servers require you to run an archival node, in other words, a full node that contains everything going all the way back to 2009, not a pruned node. So the recent quote, it's opportune, bro, you can just prune them, end quote, is yet another hand waving hand wave of something that isn't as trivial as it's made out to be because you can't just prune op returns without dumping the rest of the useful archival data. Giant op returns got pushed through in the hopes that the more badly designed bit VM scams might use op return instead of fake pub keys. What an utterly stupid thing to have done. And I agree with that. And so when people gaslight you that this stuff is prunable, yes, it technically is, but it's not really prunable. As Samson Mao writes here, it feels like the people proposing changes to Bitcoin don't really use it as I documented and as this video suggested, do Bitcoin core devs even run their own nodes? And it's quite clear that a lot of these devs, or at least some of these devs don't even own Bitcoin. So we've got a real problem here when the people who work on it are just interested in new bells and whistles or enabling, enabling spam, and they don't really run a node. They don't really use Bitcoin as money. The opportune space in transactions was originally provided as a concession and a tiny space for people to store non-monetary data on Bitcoin in a way that wouldn't bloat the UTXO set. In other words, those chunks of unspent Bitcoin. It was originally set to 40 bytes and then moved up to 83 bytes. It's now being blown open by Bitcoin Core, the consequences of which remain to be seen. But one thing we know is that we're going to be getting seeing a lot more large op return transactions. And as Knut Svanholm has pointed out, it's Jevons paradox all over again. If you build the roads, the traffic will come. So get ready for 100 kilobyte op returns. These are definitely coming. Meanwhile, Bitcoin Core has done nothing to patch the inscriptions spam hack that was made possible by the combination, as we spoke about earlier, the combination of SegWit and Taproot soft forks. Luke Dasher submitted a patch for this, which was rejected by Bitcoin Core as being quote unquote too controversial. But then a few days ago, Bitcoin Core devs merged the new opportune rules and blew open the opportune filters, which action was just as controversial as Luke's patch, but it was also pro spam, which seems justification enough for them at least to merge the new code even if it is highly controversial. That's why you should dump Bitcoin Core and run Bitcoin Knots instead. And I'll put a link in the description notes below to this video that shows you exactly how to do that. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you wanna be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.